You can do this stuff with containers, uh, you can do it on roofs, it, it doesn't matter. But, you know, even at DW Fields here, you know, you can create three zones. Where can you lose the lawn and not miss it? Where do you want, like, low cover, low growing cover, but it doesn't have to be grass, but you want it to be mostly green? And I've been really successful with this with just wild strawberry, and it's cheap, too. And then where do you want lawn, and how can you change that to manage it a little bit better? So let's look at like areas where you want to keep your lawn. And this also helps if you don't like mowing or don't want to pay the lawn company as much. So if you let your lawn grow a little bit higher, you know, three or four inches, you won't have that Fenway Park like high and tight, nice look, but it's really not going to make much of a difference. But if you're mowing three, four, five inches and letting it grow up to six inches right here, your roots are going to typically grow deeper, especially with the right type of grass mix which means they're not going to need as much water and they're not going to need as susceptible to drought. If you're using a mulching mower and not bagging it, um, you're going to return, the grass will slowly decompose and it's going to reduce the amount of nitrogen and other fertilizer that you're going to need to use. If you have the time to aerate, so that's just basically, you can see this if you go golfing too and they pull the big plugs and chunks out right there. When they're pulling that out, that allows more soil, air, and nutrients to grow in and the roots can weave together and be basically stronger. And then you can also start using um, a drought tolerant grass mix. Again, it may yellow up a little bit more in August, but it's worthwhile. You know, two sites that, that, that can work here, and you can also get this at your garden stores, uh, like, um, like Palilios will probably have a drought tolerant grass mix, but Prairie Moon is one place that I've had some success with drought tolerant grass mixes. You know, that's not too expensive uh, here. And then this one, Doug Ptolemy has promoted, this is called, um, from Twin City, see this is a bee lawn uh, that's also there. I think, you just full disclosure, I think this one is too expensive for a pound when you see this one. But th this is another option for like a bee friendly one that also mixes in plants and clover right through there. But those are two areas. So, and like I said, please feel free to ask any questions as we're going along. You know, well where can you have green uh, ground cover but not grass. So again, as you're looking at this and think of this, think about like, you know, is it, is it in the shade, is it in the sun, is it wet, is it dry, how does it drain? But you can have native plants that form like mats of ground cover that don't get very large from wild strawberry. This is a carex, this is a sedge, and so it's like a grass and this really holds in water really well. You know, you got creeping flocks, but I, and this is especially successful if you have like a uh, you know, if you're near the sidewalk and the grass always dries out and brown, you can't keep it as keep growing there. Like that, they call it a hell strip, basically, because it's so tolerant. So I hate that area. And what I've done in my yard, and I meant to take pictures this morning, but I didn't, is I cut out the, the a foot, foot and a half along the entire edge. And I still have grass behind, but I also have native plant gardens nearby. And I bought, it was the, is it the New England Wildflower? No, um, the Native Plant Trust. They changed their name up in framing him at the Garden of the Woods. I brought one wild strawberry plant because it was in June and they were mostly sold out and I split it a little and I have probably 45, 50 wild strawberry plants that have grown because they keep growing through runners through there and I'm creating basically a living mulch as it's going along there. And I also planted maybe 500 or so sunflowers and cosmos and stuff like that in there as well along this edge and right there as this, as this moves in, you're gonna, I have less runoff into the roads, but especially if you plant these sedges, because a lot of this stuff will just stay and it's very hardy and then expands from there. But I can't say enough nice things about wild strawberry because, you know, I don't have the numbers in front of me, but insects eat the leaves, but not too much. And then the fruits there as well. So you've got the insects for the birds and other animals, and then the fruit for the birds, like cat birds and stuff like that. Do you have a question? Those, you got a high acid area for those plants? No, it's not. Yeah, for the strawberries, you mean? Oh, for any one of them. Uh, any one of those for high acid area? Acid. Well, the strawberries, the strawberries should do fine. It, it, it depends how high it is. They should be fine. They're pretty tolerant to a lot of those. You could also, if you have a higher acid area, you could use low bush uh, blueberry. Do what? You could you could use a low bush blueberry. Would work would work pretty well depending on how is it possible? The sedge or the flocks? Well, the so I'm not sure about the flocks. The sedges, there's a lot of species of sedges that go along the whole gradient of like at different environmental conditions. So there, there's going to be the right sedge for a higher acid area. I just don't know right off the top of my head, but like 
uh, Grow Native, that's the New England plant, tr uh, the Native Plant Trust in Framingham, and then also uh, out in Western Mass. They have like the environmental conditions for each type of those plants that I can help you with. But with strawberries, don't plan on harvesting because the birds will get them before you work. Right, yeah, yeah. With the wild strawberries, they're, they're very tasty, but they're, they're also very small. Yeah. I have a mix of wild strawberries and then also just regular garden farm strawberries there too that are growing around. And so far they've done well. I just let them grow wherever they want to. Yeah. Um, okay. Clarification. Yep. On that chart with the different uh, lengths to your grass, you talked about it's not the longer roots. Mm -hmm. uh, to be clear, you said it requires less water only because they're finding the water in the deeper soil. Yeah, yeah. So you're not wasting city water. Basically, yeah, and, and, and you don't need to water as frequently because they're gonna they're, the water the water can also go into the soil a lot better. So when it rains or when you're watering it, if the soil's compacted, it's just going to run off right away. If you have deeper roots, the soil's going to be more aerated and it's going to be more likely to be able to um, go deeper into the soil. And on the bottom of the chart, yeah. the plugs act as a fertilizer, right? They just leave them there. Right? If you leave them there, they can act as a fertilizer too, yeah. And it basically, it basically um, uh, prevents the grass roots from matting too much and, and suffocating things out. All right, and then, okay, and then like native plant gardens and rain gardens, again. So I've worked with Stoden, and we've done some native plant gardens at the Cedar Hill Golf Club. We're also adding some to uh, the rec department there. We got a MACP <coughs> grant, and then also the senior center as well. We have a, a native garden, but there's lots of areas that you can go look at these types of gardens when you look at this. But you want to think about like soil, sun exposure, moisture, drainage, and I'm not going to talk about too much about a, a, um, a rain garden, but this is something you might also want to keep in mind as you know you look at your uh, planning stages with DW fields and areas where you do get a lot of runoff and want to hold that in there because it's going to be engineered in the right way uh, and designed. But these could be really, really uh, wonderful uh, both for plants but also for capturing rainwater. Sean, I've got a question about yeah. the rain You know, when you see a lot of outside of the park here, but you see a lot of these catch basins and yeah. developments and stuff. Those spaces are kind of trying to create I would almost definitely think there's, there's like, so areas where I think you could have huge environmental positive impacts are highway on and off ramps where all the grass is right. and stuff like this. But then in those catch basins, because rain gardens are trickier. You can have thirsty gardens where you, where you can get a lot of water, but you know, the, for the plants where it's just wet, that's really not a rain garden. A rain garden is going to be like, you know, a depression in the ground, it's going to be engineered right, where it can fill up with water and the plants can do well, and then it just gets bone dry and it's really harsh in relative condition because it's not a wet area, it's an area to catch water. And most of the time, you know, if it's the middle of the summer, there's no rain. Right. So they got to, they got to be super hardy. So, and you have to also, you know, you have to, you have to plant them, you know, because you, you want it deeper like in the catch basin. So the plants in the middle will be different from the plants on the right. outside because they, you know, they have to be kind of like that, you know, think of the spring flood time plants, plants that are tolerant to that. So things like cardinal flowers, certain species of dogwood, you know, uh, yellow stem dogwood, stuff like that through there. So um, you did not use a liner? No, you wouldn't use a liner for that. And, you know, and so like also when I start to transition in my yard, I hate ripping grass up too, just as an aside. You know, so when I want to convert like uh, an area from grass, I used to dig everything up, but it was, I mean, it took me days a week. What I do now is I just use cardboard boxes or Trader Joe's bag of newspaper, cover it, basically cover the whole grass over with a couple layers of that, and then put dirt or mulch, depending on what I want to do on top of it, and then plant over it, and it will just supplicate the grass. But because I'm not using a, a, a plastic-based liner, whether it's landscape fabric, I use landscape fabric in my experiments, and the grass just grows into it, you can't get it out. The Over a year or two, depending on how wet it is, uh, the grass decomposes and the paper decomposes, so you're basically composting it there, and then you convert it over with, you know, very minimal work. Um, and then in terms of like rain gardens, just you know, you know, you know, it reduces runoff by uh, approximately 90 percent. This is information that we did at Mass Audubon uh, at the Broadmeadow Brook in Worcester. We have a large rain garden that's there, and then you know, 200 years for maintenance is in terms of what you're thinking, but you you filter out tons of junk, 
tons of pollution in there, whether it's nitrogen, whether it's you know suspended solids, just you know like junk from the roads and everything like that. Instead of like the petroleum or junk from the cars that they're going into there, it's going to the soil as opposed to directly in the waterway. You're reducing the sedimentation in DW fields or wherever else like that. So here's a native garden that we have at Wellfleet. This is at Mass Audubon here as well. But what I want you to think about here is also just be thinking in layers, you know, and I'll, I'll talk about what that is, but just think in layers with this. You know, you higher plants, lower plants, shrubs, at different layers with your eye. And as you're thinking about this, I'd like you to think about, like, where is the water flow when the rain is captured? Where do you want to put plants down to capture water? This could be the thirsty part of it. You know, what's going to act as your living mulch and ground cover? Because this living mulch that I'm talking about, or leaf litter, that's super important for a lot of ways. And, you know, leaves are really, really important once they fall. Because not only are they providing a space for, say, insects to hide or caterpillars, moss, like to pupate and move through there, you know, like on a day like today, if you have grass and you get a leaf litter that wasn't picked up, you put your hand in the leaf litter, it's going to be wet, it's going to be moist, the, the water's not of ever. You put your hand on the grass, it's going to be, you know, pretty dry. Uh, to mow dry that. But it also stabilizes the soil. It'll smother a lot of the weeds out right through here. So like with the strawberries, over time what I'm trying to do is just create a living mulch that kind of, you know, the older leaves decompose and come through there. And I'm going to add other plants in there too. But it can be complicated because, you know, this can be adapted to uh, container gardens as well too. You know, start small where you might be choosing a native plant or two, you know, a shrub. Like you could use nine bark. You know, this is a more southern species, so it's going to be probably better adapted as the client gets a little bit warmer. I've had really good success with high bush blueberry. You know, a lot of insects eat the leaves. You have the fruit that if you want to cover them up, the birds want you know, if you want them for the birds, you leave them open. We have cat birds that come to my front yard every year just to eat the blueberries. <laughs> Sweet pepper bush is a great hardy plant. Uh, that's one of the only plants that blooms in the summertime. So you can see and smell that during the summertime. That's also a native plant. Do you have a question? <coughs> And then like another one, red choker, but there's all these wonderful lists in like the Native Plant Trust or in other sites that you can use. You know, think of shorter and taller perennial plants. You can also plant annuals, but you want things that come back. You know, from like an iris or like right now columbine is blooming. Um, and then, and which is a really nice spring flower that hummingbirds might visit. You know, blue mist flower, spotted bee balm. Spotted bee balm is this really beautiful like light lavender purple with dark purple spots and yellow on it. You know, it's a little bit different. It lives for like two or three years, but seeds really well. Because if you're thinking of a shorter term perennial or even annual, if it seeds really well, you'll have it most, if not every year. You know, then you can have taller plants. Like I have New England aster in, in the yard, but like for example, like New England aster, I'm finding is, is a little bit more aggressive for my liking. You know, it really will take over. So if you have it in some spots, it's great, but in the area where I had a lot of plants that I wanted there, I have to aggressively manage it because it grows through rhizomes. It's also why I don't recommend people plant common milkweed in their gardens to help the monarchs because that's an aggressively forming rhizome plant so it comes up everywhere. If you want to plant milkweed, you know, one that you can plant is butterfly weed right here. It's this, it's this orange flower or swamp milkweed. They sell it at garden stores as rose milkweed because I don't think they think swamp milkweed is a marketable name for it. Uh, and that, that's, again, growth grows from rhizomes but it typically needs to be wetter uh, so it doesn't, it's not super aggressive. Um, so that's a really nice plant to have there too. But I'll show you pictures of ironweed in a second. Ironweed does really well. A little bit more aggressive seeds really well. You know, things like Jerusalem artichoke that is also food, larkspurs, but there's lots of different plants that you can use here um, for that. You know, just as an example here, because um, that I want to talk about here, this is, one, this is a picture from my garden. So here's a ruby-throated hummingbird from last, uh, last summer. And this is New York ironweed, but this is species of ironweed right here. And I have hummingbirds coming to my yard every day yeah. on like their lunch and dinner rush. You know, they basically gro they're basically grocery shopping. And believe it or not, too. Is that the school bus at three? Yeah, exactly, the school bus at three. And, you know, believe it or not, you know, they're also not only drinking nectar, half their diet has to be insects too. You know, they're not just drinking the sugar water for that. They have to um, eat a lot of insects here. And I'm getting more and more birds in my yard. And I only have a quarter to a half an acre. It's relatively small, you know, lawns on either side of me that are pretty good. 
And I have two pairs of nesting chickadees, I have nesting song sparrows, you know, nothing super uncommon, but uh, you know, I'm getting a lot more birds in my yard and a lot more wildlife and animals through here. I had hummingbirds last night, just so you know. Uh, yeah. oh. and, and so take a penny out of your pocket, that's how much they weigh, okay? Yeah. And they just flew 3,000 miles, yeah. okay? Yeah. And so, you know, and but the, the amazing thing is here, and I'm gonna show this because I just happened to discover this last week near where I live, that's nesting probably within a couple of houses to a quarter mile, an eighth of a mile from my house. They're going to be pretty close by. And so I was walking last Sunday here, and just, just like you would at D.W. Fields, there's, um, there's a Mansfield, it's a, a, just some conservation land in the town. Can everybody see the hummingbird nest? No, I'm kidding, you can't, okay? Yes, yes. <laughs> so... So it's right. So I just happened to see it. I just want to say this could, this will, this will, this will. If there's a hummingbird around, they, their nest is going to be there. But since I actually was able to photograph it building the nest, if I had internet right now, I'd show you the, the actual building the nest too, uh, in a video. The nest is right here, but it's somewhere in this picture. I'll go in a little closer. So this is the nest on one side right there. And look how they're using natural materials. Is that moss? So there's no moss in it, but there's lichens and there's seeds. So the hummingbird is right there building the nest. And you can, so right here with its feet, it's knitting with its feet and making the nest with its feet. And it's weaving with its beak and it's ornamenting it. So it went out earlier that day or the day before with, and collected bunches of spider webs. And it uses the spider webs as like a silk glue or tape around the thing. And I don't know what this seed is, but it's almost definitely a seed with the way that it looks. It's putting them in there so when an, a predator is looking at it, and I just saw it whip in there, and I, 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 have, I just don't have the video like this on YouTube. Um, I know how they build their nest because of a PBS documentary. Like you would never even notice how well camouflage is. So you could have one in your yard and just not even see it here. You can see, even when it's taking off, this is from the other side on the other side of the tree. There's no way you'd know that's the nest. Here's it from one side. Okay, here's it from the other side. So it's built it along the branch perfectly. You know, and those lichens weren't there, and these whatever these seeds are uh, wasn't there before. What Just do you so think you the seeds or why seeds? Because they and look the like the they look like the bark. Like Even the with the way the hummingbird, you know, the hummingbirds are really bright and green. But what's really amazing, and this picture does it pretty well, and let me just go back to this picture, okay? You can see the iridescence will go from basically a, a light green to almost a black green, but then in its face and its feathers and underneath, and I'll show you a picture right here. This is an honest hummingbird, and this is the video I played, it's on the internet. You can see how it goes from light to dark right here. You can see here it's got pine seeds shingled in there. But what's happening in this picture too, when it's sitting there, okay, and when it's sitting there like this, or sitting there like this, if you're a predator or a person and you don't see that there, your eye doesn't even make up an image of a hummingbird because it's seeing the light, see how the light and dark colors in the backdrop of the sky and then the, then the white right here? So you can even look at the hummingbird and it disappears even though you're looking right at it because your brain won't make up that image because it's, it's thinking it's the background. It's the same kind of cognitive principle with animals when they're looking at it too because they're perfectly camouflaged in there. And with this picture here, you can see how it's holding and carrying the seed. But let me find, where's the other one? I'm gonna, I'm gonna trump it in. It's actually carrying things with its talons, its back legs too as well. I'm pulling that in there as it's weaving, it. oh there it is, you can see it really well there. It's got seeds in its front. It could be some type of fungus that it's picking up too as well, but you can see it basically, the branch becomes the nest and the nest becomes the branch right there so you don't see it. And so just, I just wanna kinda of like leave with that because I get these in my yard every day. We talked about the bluebirds, I don't have the picture of the bluebirds in here, but I can show you a picture of them collecting and uh, insects for their, their young. But when you have the right plants, you know, for example, like an oak tree could support over 600 in different species of insects. You're, you're looking at pounds and pounds of plants a day for these birds. You know, it's really important because in the winter time, they're basically in southern Mexico, Belize, Guatemala, Guatemala, 
all the way down to a little bit of northern Panama, Costa Rica in the winter, and they're flying 3,000 miles up into the red zone, which is their breeding season right through here, where, where they're breeding up into Massachusetts. They showed up just a couple of weeks ago um, through that. And so I just wanted to highlight kind of like the importance of these native plants, you know, what they mean to the animals and how much they can have an impact on, you know, the animals, but also like water flow, infrastructure. Um, and, you know, there's work involved here, but you can make a huge difference, especially in the park for the wildlife and, you know, water management with, with these. But with that, I'd be, I just know in the interest of time, I'd be more than happy to take any questions. Awesome. Questions? Yes. Uh, yes. Hi. Uh, question. Is, um, we have a very large bird feeder with all sorts of things, and that's still, that's a good thing to do, or, or no? So the question is about bird feeders and having them hanging yeah. up right now. So in this do it year, year round. Yeah, so in the summertime, uh, it's fine. Okay. Okay. In the summertime, these birds, every bird that you're seeing that's that's laying eggs with these sort of maybe goldfish and other species, they need to collect insects to feed the young or they're not gonna survive. So the feeders at most are supplemental, but they're really nice to be able to see the birds. This year we're dealing with avian flu that's attacked that's particularly hitting larger raptors like uh, hawks and uh, owls. Um, I'm not too sure about the songbirds, so the congregation could have a little bit of an impact on maybe spreading the avian flu, but again, I don't, uh, the seeds can be really beneficial in the winter time, and the best there is for black old sunflower seeds, yeah, but I, I think, you know, if you, if you like having the feeder up, I, yeah, I think it's Yeah, I mean, fine. It's, it's really a big yeah. feeder. Um, yeah. it, it seems like different, different species take, could take turns coming, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so the, the, the observation there is the different species will take turns. You, and you know, once you can learn the birds more, too, and um, and see, it, like you'll see, like like blue jays will come in and pretend to be a hawk, and all the birds will fly away and they'll take the themselves. Yeah. Yeah. You know, one thing it's like a hierarchy. Yeah, they're, they're really yeah. Really yeah. Yeah. the yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 I want to show some, you know, just I'll, I'll answer the question, but I just want to show something here as well too. Let me just call up another presentation that I have. So I want to show you one really nice thing that can. Um, I, I pulled these slides over this morning, so that's my great Oh yeah, and they just come every day. Uh, let's see, let me just find. So like, for example, like this, this yellow warbler is going to be nesting in DW fields. Like you can hear it singing. This yellow rump warbler, this is going to be, it probably is left, it's an early migrant, but you'll see this, you know, end of April, beginning of May. This Nashville warbler is definitely a DW fields right now. Um, but what I want to show you, you know, you've got you have Orioles that are nesting there. I've got an Orioles nesting in the yard. Yeah. I do too. Yeah. Yep. I'm on Pleasant Street. Yeah. I want to like We got a better sequel. I just want to find. Okay. What's so, Okay. I don't. I just want. I just want to try. I want to try. Baltimore Oriole. Okay, that'll be loud. So on your smartphone, you can, um, and I can, I can come put the web, oh no, I can't put the website up because it's not on the internet. There's an app called Merlin, okay? Yeah, the magician. Yep, just like the magician. You oh. can, you can put, drop a photo in there and yeah. I might be able to identify it. You can go through different characteristics of finding stuff, but you can do a sound ID. And this is what I'm talking about with the feeders. Oh. Okay, so I'm just going to play the sound ID right here. Okay, so it's recording right now. Baltimore Oriole. Identified it as the Baltimore Oriole. It's not perfect, yeah. but like with your feeders and everything like this, yeah. <laughs> you can use this and just put it out on your deck or anything. Like when I was down at the on my walk yesterday, I was near a wetland in Canton, and I had 15 species of birds there, and I'm using it to kind of learn the songs better for myself. So we like I wouldn't have recognized Red Iberia song yesterday. Now I can recognize it a little bit, and we had it singing this morning and yesterday there as well. But it really makes you know, it, it's an easier way to kind of like learn what's around you. You also notice it's a lot more noisier than you realize too. Uh, that can be really helpful and it's free and it's from Cornell and it's just top notch. And, it, and if you're diligent, you'll know the songs Burley, before Burley. you actually find the birds. Burley. Right, and that's so you can start doing stuff like that. So here, I'll write it on the top of the screen. Burley. Burley. 
And, and all about birds is the website that Cornell uses that's really wonderful. Uh, I knew there were other hands. Yes? Twice I have seen a female cardinal sucking on the flowers of a crab apple. Mm -hmm. is, are they getting honey? Because it's like always early spring. Helping with the, I'm wondering if it's got a nutrient for their eggs or something. So it could be sucking on the flowers, but I think it's probably doing. Here's a picture of a natural warbler I took last year or two years ago. So think of its beak like tweezers. That's exactly what she's doing. And she's what it's like doing is squeezing a pollen. This natural warbler, is, its beak is about to open it up, okay? And see here, you can see it's fully opening it up. Here it's pinching it on the outside, yeah. and then it's opening up again. So what it's probably doing is killing a caterpillar there and then eating it. Really? That's what I would suspect, because crab apples just aren't going to have enough, if any, nectar for an oriole, uh, for a cardinal or for an oriole. So they must be pretty small caterpillars, because I can yeah. see them. Yeah, they will be. Like in, so I like, saw the flowers. Yeah, so here, so I, you know, normally I would have put up a picture of this backlit. Here's that yellow rump warbler right here. That, that I took this at cheap pasture in Easton while my daughter was at gymnastics. You can see the oaks are just coming out, so probably beginning of May. And what I want to show here is watch what it does. It looks right at the oak cat, and that's where the pollen comes out. And then it pinches it. And if you look, oh, I see. there's a caterpillar or maybe like a mayfly in the catkin right here. So in this picture, there could be 50 caterpillars or other wow. insects. You know, this, when I say like pounds and pounds of like oaks are like if you want to do the best thing for birds, it's planting an oak tree. You know, because um, they're so they're so important. Like a native oak tree, they're so important. So the and the cardinals are not good at getting caterpillars. Their beak is not built for it. They're not adept at it. So when they're inside the flowers, they're probably trying to crush it. And then there's probably so many in the and those like like the crab apples or cherries. They just have a lot of caterpillars in there. That's an easier way to get them. Because you can see here. You know, this is a much more narrower beak, so it's good at pinching and grabbing onto things. Where the where the, the cardinal's beak is really built for like crushing seeds. That doesn't yeah. mean they're not going to be able to eat insects because it's an important part of the diet. It's just a little bit more challenging. Of course. So they're like working all day, right? The dawn to dusk. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Question about caterpillars. Mm -hmm. uh, I've had large caterpillar nests in trees. Is it best to leave them? Yeah, so, uh, so the question is about large nests of caterpillars in the tree, so there's silk all around it, and then... Nine inches, you know. Yeah, so those are going to be ten caterpillars, and what's really amazing about them is they they kind of form as a colony, and you'll see them go, like, it'll they'll, they'll all fall the same path, they'll leave it, eat the leaves, and come back in. So things like yellow-billed and black-billed cuckoos will come and eat them, and there's a few other birds, and when they eat them, because they're very hairy, right? They actually, because the, the hairs are like hypodermic needles to, to irritate. They're not hairs. They're, they're, they do inject some type of toxin or irritant. And the those two species, along with others, they throw up their entire digestive lining with the needles in there and then just regrow it to eat it. So so it, it, they're, they're fine. You know, they're fine. And the, the, the <coughs> outbreaks are irregular. So it typically shouldn't harm the health of a tree. Is that broken on nest? And they end up all of your house. You yeah, know, yeah. And your shutters and everything. Yeah, <coughs> yeah. So the the, the trees <coughs> should be fine. You know. Are there yeah. two kinds of um, flickers in this area? No, there. They used to think there was a yellow shafted and red shafted flicker. Those are the same species. The red shafted ones that that's the red on the on the wings. The question about a, 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 a woodpecker called a flicker. Uh, they've realized that with genetics, those are the same species. So the one you might be thinking of is it could be a red-bellied woodpecker. Um, I grew up with a beige, beige belly, mm -hmm. and the same same head thing, you know, the, the mohawk, red yep. mohawk. But I have a pair that come and they have a white belly. Okay, yeah, and it could just be it, it's going to be the same flicker. It, it's probably just yeah. variation with.